Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. Honorable Minister of Defense and Minister with Special Functions in the Prime Minister's Department, Malaysia, Datuk Sri Hishamuddin Tun Hussein, Yang Berbahagia, Lieutenant General Datuk Sohaimi bin Haji Muhammad Zuki, Chief Executive Maidas, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure as moderator to welcome everyone to the first session of the 2018 Putrajaya Forum. The theme of the forum, as you know, is recalibrating regional security architecture. And the title of this session, the first session, is Regional Security Crescendos and Their Implications to Stability. Southeast Asia is an oasis of peace and stability. It is one of the most peaceful regions in the world. Nevertheless, it is not without challenges, some of them serious, to both security and stability, besides prosperity. This session, I believe, will be an overview session and a primer to the sessions that follow. And we have very distinguished participants in this forum, led by our Minister of Defense and uh, Minister with Special Functions in the Prime Minister's Department. Uh, I have been told as moderator that I don't have to read from their CVs, uh, just mention their positions. But I can't help but add that with the Honorable Datuk Sri Hishamuddin, he has leadership running in his veins. It is <laughs> he has many things on his mind, like the Prime Minister, but he has leadership on his, in his veins. It is in his DNA. His father was the third Prime Minister of Malaysia, and his cousin is the present Prime Minister of Malaysia. Without further ado, sir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Tan Sri Jawha, our moderator. The way he introduced me is like he's my campaign manager for the election. <laughs> my brothers, Dr. Ng and Hen, and Bapak Riyamizad, ladies and gentlemen. This gathering could not be more important for us all. We cannot deny that as a region, we have experienced an unprecedented era of peace and stability. But as many of you may know, still waters run deep. As the world grapples with the growing threat of extremist terrorism, it is crucial for us to sit down, sit down and come up with an action plan to ensure our re region continues to be peaceful and continues to be safe. I would like to remind everyone that just two years ago, the world focused on Iraq and Syria, where the Islamic State or Daesh spread and conquered large areas in order to promote their barbaric and skewed misunderstanding of Islam. We in ASEAN took a proactive step then, where we declared our strongest condemnation against the rise of violence and brutality committed by the self-declared Islamic State. Now it seems our biggest fear has become a reality. While the group has been most prominent in the Middle East, we must never dismiss the possibility that they will strike in our region. As you are all aware, there is already evidence of the unification of terrorist battalions in southern Philippines with Daesh. 
Admittedly, the situation in Iraq and Syria has rolled back and rolled back through significant territorial gains against the group. But this has given rise to the disturbing prospect that we here in Southeast Asia is in diaceous crosshairs. This threat is real, ladies and gentlemen, whether from returning fighters, regional franchises, or more disturbingly, from self-radicalized lone wolves. Worryingly, the specter of returning fighters will not import their brand of mayhem and terror to our shores, but they will try to do so by exploiting the vulnerable hotspots present in our region. So what are the lessons we have learned from Marawi? As we know, the armed forces of the Philippines have managed to recapture Marawi back from the Maute group and its followers. However, for the Maute group and other terrorist groups in Mindanao, the eventual loss of Marawi will not be so much of a setback as it is only the beginning of bolder military moves to capture territory, to demonstrate their capabilities and to rally support for the so-called Islamic State in the region, especially in the wake of IS military defeats in Iraq and in Syria. In assessing implications on stability, there are a few things we must learn about how the group has adapted to our region. Firstly, it is important to note that terrorists like the Maltese have different conceptions of victories from professional militaries. They aim to turn vulnerable populations against the military, against the government and countrymen, expose the state's inability to protect its citizens, and slowly weaken the state's resolve to secure its territories. And to achieve these objectives, the group strives to ensnare the military in a prolonged battle and create a humanitarian crisis with evacuations and displacements of people, as alluded to by our Prime Minister earlier. Secondly, instead of fighting in the jungles and in the hills, the group drew the military into an urban environment which they had prepared for in advance. Although they ceded the advantage to the military which have encircled them, this made fighting the terrorists much harder and forced the military into bombing houses, clear sniper positions and tunneled strongholds, hoping that security forces would be blamed for the resultant destruction. Indeed, much of Marawi has been devastated and the fallout will transpire when the evacuees return. Thirdly, the group has resorted to suicidal attacks, viewed as heroic acts to gain another narrative advantage against a powerful enemy, celebrated by terrorists and their supporters as martyrs. Should suicide bombers become a trend it would signal a game changer, not just in our region, but will also continue to inspire a wave of lone wolf attacks globally. Ladies and gentlemen, regional hotspots. The mushrooming of affiliated terrorist organizations in the region, creating hotspots and flashpoints, especially in the southern Philippines and southern Thailand, should not be taken lightly. In addition, the increasing proliferation of humanitarian crisis in our region also serves as a potential vulnerability exacerbated by the ongoing Rohingya refugee crisis in Bangladesh. On that note, Malaysia is at the front line 
of humanitarian assistance for the Rohingya refugees with our Malaysian Field Hospital in cooperation with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates being a key factor in addressing the socio-economic issues at its roots. This humanitarian crisis must be resolved and it must be resolved collectively. Collectively by countries of Southeast Asia to diminish the risk of these refugees being exploited by extremist groups such as the Islamic State or Daesh. We fear that if the situation of the Rohingya Muslim minority in the Rakhine State is not properly addressed, militant elements could infiltrate and possibly radicalize this oppressed community. I reiterate, Malaysia, together with our partners, remain committed to assist the humanitarian situation on the ground, especially in Bangladesh, to ensure it does not serve as a foundation for potential conflict. Closer to home in our eastern state of Sabah, Nor Miswari unrealistic dream to form a caliphate in the Sulu Sea means that we will not be able to take our eyes off this area anytime soon. Together with Indonesia and Philippines, me, myself, together with Bapak Riyamizad and Secretary Delphin, and with Singapore and Brunei, Pihin here is with me and Eng Heng is here with me as observers. These common maritime areas that we share, we must together ensure the trilateral cooperative arrangement initiative that have been started off by us must continue to be strengthened. Cooperation between three plus two countries will be widened and we must have a coordinated naval and air patrols in the waters in a wider scale because we have proven that it is unrealistic for each individual country in ASEAN to face Daesh separately. We must realize and we must not be in denial that militant groups in the area have internationalized their operations across boundaries, rejecting state identities and allegiances, and duplicating Daesh's modus operandi. It is my belief, ladies and gentlemen, a united multi-state front comprising not only of tri-nation initiatives, but all in this region especially, will shatter any dreams of a utopian Islamic caliphate being established in our region. That requires courage, that requires commitment, that requires a very strong sense of understanding between all the stakeholders, but it requires also a very strong political will amongst our leaders to ensure that that at the end of the day is our objective. So ladies and gentlemen, what can we do to forge a path forward in these uncertain times? I believe firstly the threat of Daesh can only be met by a closer cooperation between and within nations. This will require what I have reiterated before the SEAL approach, S-E-A-L. That is to say, strategy, engagement, anticipation, and leadership. We need to strategize to defeat radicalization. We must engage all internal and external stakeholders. We must do a better job at anticipating potential threats and we urgently need clear-sighted leadership to bring all these things together. Secondly, the exciting possibility is the adoption of issue-driven sub-regional security initiatives 
It's not necessary to wait for all 10 ASEAN countries to agree on any initiative that can proceed today, as we have proven in the Sulu Seas. Our approach is always to prioritize ASEAN's central centrality, yes. However, the reality of our very diverse political systems and foreign policy prioritizes means that it's sometimes more productive to work via focused caucuses among member states. At the end of the day, these initiatives are fundamentally building blocks towards our greater goal of a secure and united ASEAN community. Thirdly, and most importantly, is leadership. An increasingly rare commodity in this day and age, but one which we desperately need more than ever before. I am sure my brothers on stage with me agree that being firm in our convictions, calling for compromise and uplifting our followers, rather than pandering to the lowest common denominator, is much needed in these uncertain times. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, while the challenges towards regional security are potent, the opportunities and pathways are just as substantive. Any builder will tell you that construction is a long and arduous process, which requires patience and which requires a lot of hard work. This should be our stance as we seek to forge a more secure and prosperous Southeast Asia. Our journey should not stop where it began. We must put greater effort together to integrate our capacity and capabilities in paving a stronger working relationship down to its very lowest level. We must continue to strive for a safer and more stable region as the only way forward for us. And that's why I hope that the participants of this Putrajaya Forum will be able to contribute to how we can take security integration in our region to even greater heights. I do look forward to hearing your thoughts and debates on this matter. Again, before I conclude, let me thank the organizers for this great opportunity. It is a great honor and privilege to be with my two brothers, Enheng and Bapak Yamizat. I hope that you will be able to come back again and I will still be the Minister of Defence to greet you <laughs> when you come back. Dan saya sebut kepada Bapak Ria Mizat ni, kita di sini macam hari raya. Dan bendera-bendera luar di luar tu yang bergibar megah berwarna-warni ni untuk menyambut kehadiran Bapak Ria Mizat kepada forum kita pada hari ini. Sekian, terima kasih. Wabillahi Taufiq wa Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Uh, I don't think I need to summarize or anything like that. He was most eloquent. It is my pleasure now to welcome His Excellency Dr. Ng Eng Hin, the Minister of Defense of the Republic of Singapore. Again, I will not uh, refer to his uh, CV in, in the booklet that's with you, except to add that he is also the chair of ASEAN Defence Ministers' Meeting for this year, as well as the ASEAN Defence Ministers' uh, Plus Meeting for this year. And uh, just, I was also intrigued to note that he was a consultant surgeon specialising in surgical oncology before holding political office. Excellency. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Tan Sri Joha, Chairman, my esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Sri Shamudin, Pat Ramizad, and Under Secretary Ricardo. 
Dr. Dr. Sri Hishamuddin articulated a wish. Uh, I would just add that his wish is the same as mine. I wish him all good things. <laughs> First, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this very uh, now successful and established defense forum, the Putrajaya Forum, as well as its associated Defense Services Asia. In the next decade, we in Asia will inevitably be affected by political trends that are now widespread and gaining strength worldwide. First, economics. By any comparative standard, the tide of globalization that we witnessed in the 20th century has been enormously effective in lifting standards of living and indeed hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in many countries. Yet, a populist backlash has ensued. Local populations react against the flow of migrants into their communities, the disruption of jobs due to competition and technology, and the widening income gaps that are associated with free market policies. Politically, far-right parties that push for nationalization, nationalism, and nativist policies have gained ground. Even centrists and moderates have to adjust their own positions. The global commons of trade and finance lack champions. And indeed, even the United States that spearheaded many of the previous initiatives for common markets and rules is now pursuing an American first policy. It is likely that other countries will follow suit and to gain greater benefits for their own local economies. Some academics have coined the word geoeconomics to emphasize that trade disputes can and, ha and has historically precipitated armed conflicts. The Opium Wars in the mid-19th century is an egregious example, but many more exist to illustrate that the close nexus between trade and security. Second, strategic rivalry for both trade and security will occur in Asia. The US-China rivalry will affect all of us. China is already the leading trading partner for almost all Asian countries. The United States is still the dominant military power here and globally. This divergence in trade and security, dependence or alliances, is itself a stress factor. But other major powers, like Japan, India, and some in Europe, will also want to assert their influence in this region. That jostling for pole positions may impact small countries like Singapore and Malaysia that will be put into uncomfortable positions to choose sides. Potentially dangerous flashpoints due to the instability on the Korean Peninsula, as well as the East and South China Seas, and terrorism that my good friend Dr. Sri Hishamuddin has just mentioned are some known threats that can become proximate precipitators of conflict. The siege of Marawi last year is a stark reminder that terrorism here has evolved far beyond disparate individuals to groups that are well-connected, well-funded networks with technology and the ability to wage full-scale war against states. The terrorist fighters in Marawi were well equipped with snipers, heavy machine guns, even anti-tank weapons, and conducted urban warfare against soldiers and policemen who were not trained for that kind of fight. It took five months for the Philippine Armed Forces and Homeland Security to dislodge the militants from the city, and many lives have been lost and the city devastated. These changes occur against a backdrop of greater military spending by Asian countries that has now surpassed all historical norms. Asia, including ASEAN, has seen the highest growth in military spending in past decades. The military spending of Asia increased by more than seven times from 1975 to 2016 to reach US 430 billion, about a quarter of the world's military expenditure. 2012 in particular, 
saw Asia surpass Europe in defense spending. Within ASEAN, between 1987 and 2016, military expenditure has more than tripled in the 30 years to over US 40 billion, with much of the increase coming only in the last decade. With more capable militaries in Asia, any conflict can be devastating in scale and impact. But unlike Europe, which was united post-World War II by a never-again moment, Asia lacks the resolve born out of the horrors of war. Multilateral institutions that promote collaboration to reduce confrontation are relatively few and young. The ASEAN Regional Forum, the East Asia Summit, and the ASEAN Defence Ministers' Meeting Plus are less than three decades old and will need time to address the structural weaknesses in our regional security architecture. ASEAN will have to step up to address the security challenges in our region. It is to our intimate interest to do so. The ADMM Plus in particular is now the most important defence and security platform for this region, and we must redouble efforts to build its resilience to enhance its relevance. Hence, as Chair of ADMM this year, Singapore has proposed the three C's, counterterrorism, confidence-building measures, and chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear programs. And this has received unanimous support from the ASEAN defense ministers. First, we aim to enhance counterterrorism, leveraging on military's niche capabilities. We have proposed a three R's framework, resilience, response, recovery to put together the regional counterterrorism initiatives. And this outlines the gamut of actions needed to deal with the terrorism threat, from strengthening re resilience against attacks, coordinating our responses, and recovering from these attacks. A unified framework will strengthen our centrality in the region, as well as improve coordination and synergy. Second, we seek to strengthen regional capabilities against chemical, biological, and radiological threats by terrorists and rogue states. Central to this is an establishment of a virtual ASEAN network of CBR defense experts. A network will deepen the professional links among ASEAN experts and increase our channels that we can reach out to in event of any disaster. Third, we want to establish practical confidence-building measures and code for unplanned encounters to guide our military interactions in this area, on air as well as in air as well as on seas. This will help reduce the risk of miscalculations and de-escalate tensions. I am pleased that all of 18 ADMM Plus countries have agreed to adopt the code for unplanned encounters at sea or queues. ASEAN and Chinese navies will take a step further by putting Q